Yeah. All right. Yeah. And here's some interesting language playing around with technology. All kinds of nice angle saxon phrases. Okay, well, let's take a look at our next two protein topics, and then we're going to disappear into nice, greasy cell membranes. Okay. Uh, curious, you have, give me a lab or pick up a lab. You are? One for the woods. Oh, Miss Woods, okay. I have something for you. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Yes. Okay. Stable it, great. All right. Okay. Well, so let's take a look first at protein degradation. In other words, we're constantly making proteins, but after a while, sometimes we want to get rid of them. They don't work. Maybe they got damaged, denatured, something like that. Or we just have too many for the current time when we need to get rid of them. Most proteins are going to be destroyed through a particular pathway that was discovered only within the past 10 years, and it got somebody a trip to Stockholm, the lab, the director of the lab that mapped this pathway out, and I give you the name of this pathway. Okay, it's called the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. And this is our major way of getting rid of proteins. And it's named after two of the key components, something called ubiquitin and something we call the proteasomes. And we're going to describe those in a little bit. And what it's used for is this. It's how we get rid of proteins we don't want. You may have, at some point, produced a huge amount of a certain protein for some kind of function, and now you don't need that anymore. How do you clean up the excess? Okay, so we can get rid of excess proteins this way. We can get rid of proteins that no longer function. They're damaged in one way or another. We don't need them. They'll just clog up the works. We can get rid of proteins that are denatured or partially denatured. In other words, the tertiary structure is out of whack. Or proteins that never folded up properly to begin with. More on that. It turns out when proteins are synthesized, as we'll see later, it's hard for them to properly fold. They need some help. And even with all that help, we'll see that later, even with all that help, a lot of them still never fold up properly. So they're just sticking together in these insoluble, gloppy masses like curds of milk. You've got to get rid of them. So denatured or unfolded proteins. And finally, it turns out this pathway is actually used in some cases to regulate proteins. If you want to stop a protein's function, what is, what is going to be more effective than just destroying that protein? In protein terms, termination with extreme prejudice. We get rid of them. We kill them. Dead, dead, dead. We destroy them. So in some cases, this pathway is actually used for protein regulation. Granted, a little bit dramatic way of doing it, but it works, and it is used. So, those are kind of things that we do and that utilize this pathway. How do you get rid of proteins we don't want? Now, how does this pathway work and what goes into it? Let's take a look here. First of all, let's take a look at a couple of components. This thing called ubiquitin. Now, this would be a typical question on ACT or SAT verbal exam. What does the term ubiquitous mean? If I say something is ubiquitous in the environment, what does that mean? Everywhere. Excuse me? Diverse. Diverse? Not quite close. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's all over. Something that ubiquitous is all over the place. So if you call a protein ubiquitin, 
it must mean that you find this in all kinds of cells. And indeed you do. So ubiquitin is a small protein. About 5,000 molecular weight, about 40, 50 amino acids. It's a highly conserved protein, meaning that the amino acid sequence is almost identical from one organism to the next, even if you're talking about widely divergent organisms like, say, plants and people. So it's highly conserved. Now that tells you something. If you have a highly conserved protein, it tells you something. You're going to get mutations all over the place in any kind of gene, likewise the ubiquitin genes. But if you have a protein that sequence doesn't change, even widely divergent organisms, it changes very little, it tells you that that protein must be so important and so finely tuned that changing as little as one amino acid in the wrong place is going to be lethal. And indeed, people have done experiments where they deleted the ubiquitin genes from a wide range of cells and organisms and stuff. You're toast. It's a lethal mutation. So it's absolutely essential for life. Okay, second part of this pathway. The proteasomes. The proteasomes are barrel-shaped structures with kind of like a top lid and a bottom lid. More on that later. And the walls of the proteasome are multiple copies of three different protein digesting enzymes or proteases. So if you go into that barrel and you're a protein, you're history. Those proteases will eat you alive. It's worse than jumping into a feeding frenzy of sharks and piranhas put together. So the proteasomes are what actually destroys the protein. In each cell, this includes prokaryotes, there's a little bit different than eukaryotic ones, but each cell has a whole bunch of proteasomes floating around the cytoplasm. And these are the disposal chambers, the garbage disposal chambers for proteins we don't want or need anymore. So those are the two major components. Now let's see how this pathway works. Okay, questions so far? we have a protein we want to get rid of somehow. It could be damaged, it could be just too much of it, it could be denatured, it might not fold it properly, whatever the case is. Here's our protein. Now what's going to happen is that enzyme, and there's a whole bunch of these enzyme complexes, they're called ubiquitin ligases. And what these enzymes do is they covalently attach a chain of these small ubiquitin proteins to our target protein. So I'm just going to represent those by U's. Ligases are the enzymes that do that. There's a whole bunch of different kinds around each with targets, each with specific protein targets. Now, what's, if you're a protein and you get tagged with ubiquitin, that is your death warrant. If you wake up, exam, Tuesday the 30th, right? If you wake up Tuesday morning, the 30th, and you find a chain of covalently attached ubiquitins on you, it means you are going to have a very, very bad day. This, folks, is the death warrant. Because if you have ubiquitins attached to you, that means you're going to end up in the proteasome, the death house. 
Now, how does this process work? Well, let's take a look at the proteasome. The proteasome is a barrel-shaped structure. Now, the walls of the proteasome are a bunch of different kinds of proteases, protein-digesting enzymes, multiple copies of three different types. So if one doesn't kill you, the other two will. And the active sites are facing the inside of the barrel where they're going to do their dirty work. Then, at the bottom of the proteasome, you're going to have a lid-like structure with a little small pore that's small enough to allow peptides and amino acids out because we can always recycle those. And then the top has a second lid. And in a sense, this looks like a molecular garbage can, which is exactly what it is. So we have a top lid, which is a little more complex. Couple key things in the top lid. It's got a channel in it, okay, that will lead into the proteasome. Now that channel pore is so narrow that the only thing that can get through it is an unfolded protein, a chain of amino acids. A protein that's folded up is simply too darn large to fit into that lid, to fit into that pore. Yes? What is this down here that it's going to work? Oh, here? Peptides and amino acids. That's what comes out. Because the, pro, the, the proteases and the proteasomes chew it up, break up a protein, little short peptides, a little few amino acids and stuff, and individual amino acids. Yes? Is our test, is our test? Yes. Okay, it's in the syllabus. Okay. Uh-huh, there really is. I'll tell you more about it once I click it. Okay, so here's our top one. You've got that pore that can only fit an unfolded protein through. A folded up protein, even a small one, simply will not fit through the pore. It's just too darn small. Okay, now, we also have a protein that will bind to these ubiquitin chains, another protein that will remove the ubiquitins and keep the protein that they were attached to, and then a third protein called a chaperone. We'll see more on that in a little bit. That actually unfolds that protein and stuffs it into the pore in the top lid. So what's going to happen? Here comes a protein with a chain of ubiquitins. Okay, let's look at SAG because it knows it's about to die. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you look like that too if you knew this was going to be your last few moments of life. Okay, well, now, first thing that happens, we remove a protein in the lid, removes the ubiquitous. Because we don't need to trash those, we can reuse them again. This poor protein still stays attached to the lid, and now a second part of the lid called a chaperone, and we'll see this more in a minute. Okay, the chaperone is going to take that protein and basically unfold it, remove its tertiary structure, pull it apart into a chain of amino acids, and and then fit the thing into the lid. So now, once it's been denatured, it's been turned into a floppy chain of amino acids, we can fit it into the lid, and once it's inside, oh man, I don't want to see this. This is just too gory. And then all that's left are little tiny bits and pieces of peptides and amino acids. <laughs> yes, being thrown into the shark pool. Okay, well. And that's how we get rid of proteins. The vast majority of proteins, if we want to, we get rid of by these methods. And once again, this mechanism is absolutely critical for life. Because if you can't get rid of proteins, what's going to happen is that they're going to pile up inside the cell 
to the point where they just clog up and gum up the works and the cell can no longer function and eventually dies. Now, case in point, we were mentioned, yes? What's the C word? Can you spell it? C-H-A? Chaperone. C-H-A-P-A-R-O-N-E. We're going to cover that in just a moment, too. That'll be your next topic. You'll see. They play numerous roles in cells. Okay, now. <laughs> well, at least it was cell phone that broke the right there. All right. Okay, well, at any rate, hey, nobody got in a car wreck either this time. Boy, they took that whole tree out. That was a big tree. They knocked that over like it wasn't even there. Of course, that car didn't look in good shape either. <laughs> okay, well, at any rate. Yeah, he's gone. Okay. Uh, I think Thursday, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was Thursday. Oh, it's Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, at any rate, a good example of what happens if you can't get rid of certain proteins are those prions. Remember, we use prions as those things that cause these spongiform encephalopathies, in other words, holes in the brain, scrapey, CJB, and human stuff like that. The, and we said that the prion protein has two stable tertiary structures. One, the normal one, the other, the disease-causing one. The problem with that disease-causing one is it's resistant to this stuff. It's almost impossible to digest. So what happens if you have these prions, especially since they can convert normal ones into the disease version, the molecular vampires? Okay, what happens is the stuff piles up in the brain, starts clumping up together, and then eventually shuts down the function of that cell, and the cell dies. And then you start getting holes in your brain. And then you join a certain political party. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens in the late stage, terminal stages. <laughs> okay, I love these guys. All right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> By the way, that's just one example. One protein that in that other tertiary structure form, you can't get rid of it. Piles up and kills the cell ultimately. So clearly, this is a general mechanism for getting rid of almost all the proteins we don't want or don't need anymore. Okay, questions on that? Okay, now one interesting thing about this pathway, it's like we're just getting rid of taking out the trash, the stuff we don't want. In some cases, it's actually used as a means of protein regulation, regulating proteins by their destruction. Of course, a dead protein, a destroyed protein, isn't going to be able to do whatever it's supposed to do. So, so we could say regulation by death. Okay, <laughs> two examples I'm going to give, because we touched on those already, and we will touch on another one later. Example number one. Happens just before anaphase of mitosis. Now you may recall that anaphase is when the chromatids on each chromosome are pulled apart by the spindle and moved to opposite sides of the cell. Now in order to do that, we have to do a couple things. One of them is that's when our initiator mitosis, the cyclin-dependent kinase, or CDK, attached to the cyclin, it's called cyclin B. We described that example before. What happens is just before anaphase starts, the cyclin gets tagged with ubiquitin and destroyed in the proteasomes. What that means, of course, is when the cyclin gone, the CDK is shut off. No matter what else you do to it, it's gone. It will not work anymore, and that means it can't phosphorylate anything. Okay, so, cyclin B destruction that gets, shuts down the CDK, and then telophase in mitosis, essentially the reverse of prophase. That's when phosphatases are undoing everything the CDK did at the beginning of mitosis. Plus, it turns out that chromatids, the two parts, the replicate DNA chromosome, they're held together by proteins that join one to the other. And there's these protein links. And once again, those get trashed by the ubiquitous proteasome pathway. So we can say links between the chromatids 
Because otherwise, if you didn't cut those legs, if you didn't destroy those legs, the spindle could not possibly pull a chromosome apart into two chromatids. They're just glued together. But we're going to unglue them with this. And what does this is a particularly ubiquitous hybridase called the anaphase promoting complex. And it's one member of these ubiquitin ligases that's activated to initiate anaphase. Okay, so that's example one. Example number two is an important signaling pathway. We're going to mention this later. And this signaling pathway, we'll describe a little more uh, when we talk about signaling. called the Wnt signaling pathway. Now, without going into too much detail, this pathway is very important in development because it's involved in telling what's the dorsal ventral axis of both the embryo and many tissues, like the central nervous system, the spinal cord, the brain. In other words, this pathway says what is belly and what is back, the dorsal ventral axis. Question back there. Uh, what does that word say? Right here, WNT. Oh, anaphase? A ubiquitin ligase. In other words, the anaphase promoting complex is one of many different ubiquitin ligases. Okay, so the second one, this signaling pathway, it's very important development because in many tissues and organs and in the whole embryo, it says what's belly and what's back, the dorsal ventral axis. Okay, now. It turns out it relies on the destruction or the salvation of a particular very important transcription factor. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to DNA and regulate whole batteries of genes. And that one happens to go by the name It's called beta cadmium, And this one regulates whole batteries of genes, turning on genes that specify cells are going to turn into ventral or belly-type tissues. Okay, now what happens? In the absence of these wind proteins that are going to, uh, they're secreted by cells and other cells respond to it. In the absence of this, this beta cadmium gets targeted by ubiquitin ligase, tagged with ubiquitin, and it ends up getting, getting, getting ah, sorry, and ends up getting destroyed in proteasomes. So, ordinarily, beta cadmium is sentenced to death the moment it's made. But when you do have these wind signaling proteins around, when that happens, when the wind proteins are around, beta cadmium does not get targeted with ubiquitins. So it doesn't get destroyed. It's like and wakes up, I've been saved, right? Okay. Okay, well, anyway, when it's saved, when it's not destroyed in proteasomes, what happens to it? It goes into the nucleus and then it regulates whole batteries of genes. Major developmental events are due to these proteins. So here again, we have two examples of proteasomes, the ubiquitous proteasome pathway being used to regulate proteins by their destruction or by not destroying them. So clearly this pathway is very important, not just to take out the garbage and clean up all the trash in the cell, but also for protein regulation in some cases. Okay, questions on that? Well, time to go to a new segment. Oh boy. <laughs>